Chapter 1. Pemberley, June 3rd, 1812. Mr. and Mrs. Bingley will occupy the blue suite at the west end of the guest wing, and Mr. and Mrs. Hurst will be in the yellow suite across the corridor. Miss Bennet will be in the green room, and Miss Bingley, as usual, will be in the pink room. Darcy nodded at his housekeeper and said, Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. I believe that will do very well. As always, I appreciate your diligent service. It is my pleasure, sir, the older woman returned. Is there anything else? I think that is all, thank you. The lady bobbed her head and departed, leaving Fitzwilliam Darcy, master of the great estate of Pemberley, alone in his study. A quick glance at the clock showed it was but seven o'clock in the morning, and Mrs. Ansley would not be here for another thirty minutes. There were, of course, agricultural papers to read and letters to write, but nothing was of great urgency. Darcy wandered over to the large window facing east, beyond which lay a well-manicured lawn and the paved path which led to the extensive stables of Pemberley. His friend, Charles Bingley, would arrive in a few hours, along with his two sisters, his brother by marriage, Bingley's new wife, and the new wife's sister. Darcy ran a weary hand down his face and released a soft sigh. He should have known that Bingley would get into trouble in Hertfordshire without his own guiding hand and direction. Last autumn, Bingley had leased Netherfield Park, located only four and twenty miles from town, which seemed a perfect opportunity for Bingley to practice overseeing an estate. When Bingley had first spoken of finding an estate a year previously, Darcy had offered to assist his friend for a few months as the younger man learned about the various responsibilities and challenges of managing an estate. Darcy was very fond of Bingley, and the two were great friends, despite the fact that Darcy was closely related to the Earl of Matlock, and Bingley was merely the very wealthy son of a successful man of trade. But then, last summer, came the catastrophe at Ramsgate. Darcy's sister Georgiana had been greatly distressed by both George Wickham's lies and treachery, Darcy had known in his heart of hearts that it would be unconscionable for him to leave Georgiana alone at Pemberley, which forced him to bow out of his plan to join Bingley in Hertfordshire. Thus, the two friends had not seen each other for a year, and in the interim, Charles Bingley had met a blonde angel in Hertfordshire by the name of Miss Jane Bennet, and promptly married her. Darcy groaned again, more loudly now. He knew very little about the new Mrs. Bingley, except that she was, of course, exceptionally beautiful, along with, of course, being celestial and pure. Bingley had fallen in love many a time with blonde beauties, but he had always fallen out of love in short order. Darcy was certain that if he had been at Netherfield with Bingley, he would have talked sense into his friend before Bingley took the fatal step of marriage. But Darcy had been at Pemberley in Derbyshire, not at Netherfield Park in Hertfordshire, and now it was too late. For better or for worse, Bingley was married. Darcy was certain that the new Mrs. Bingley had married her husband for his wealth, but he hoped that the lady would treat Bingley well and be faithful to him. His friend was not the sort of man to marry for money or connections, which was just as well. The Bennets, while members of the minor gentry, could not boast of either advantage. Well, he would soon find out how bad it was. Bingley had spent the early part of the season in London with his new bride and two of her many sisters, and he was now travelling north on a protracted journey with yet another sister, which included visiting some of the great houses along the way. Darcy, informed of this plan, had naturally invited Bingley and his party to Pemberley for two weeks. He was looking forward to seeing his friend very much, as he had found the last year a lonely one. On the other hand, he was anxious about being faced with the reality of how poorly his friend had chosen without his wise oversight. His gloomy thoughts were interrupted by the sudden sight of his sister, Georgiana Darcy, dressed in a sprig muslin dress, walking briskly across the lawn toward the walled garden near the southeast corner of the mansion. It was still very early, and most young ladies of her age would still be abed, but Georgiana was not most young ladies.'
Indeed, she was not like most young ladies. Darcy lifted his hands and covered his face, swallowing hard in an attempt to retain control over his emotions. Of all the tasks which had been laid on his shoulders in the last seven years, the heaviest was his dear sister. He loved Georgiana more than his own life, but he was often at a loss as to how to care for her properly. Lady Anne Darcy, who had never been strong, had died when Georgiana was but five years of age. Their father, George Darcy, had passed on through Heaven's Gates, when Darcy was one and twenty and Georgiana but nine. It fell to him, to a mere older brother, to guide an unusual young woman through her adolescence, to arrange for her welfare and her instruction so that when the time came she could make her way, head held high, through the shoals of London society. He knew he had failed in this, at least. Georgiana was still awkward around strangers and often unpleasantly blunt in her speech, she had made some progress in relating courteously to others in the last years, and then he, fool that he was, had sent her to Ramsgate with Mrs. Young, who had proven entirely treacherous. The entire episode with George Wickham had been agonizing for both Darcy's, and Georgiana had withdrawn even further into her shell. She was, he knew, happy here at Pemberley, but she could not stay here forever. There was a whole beautiful world out there, and Georgiana, with her intelligence and her position as a Darcy, would be a pearl of great price to some lucky gentleman. There was a rustle behind him, and Darcy turned to see that Mrs. Ansley, Georgiana's current companion, was standing in the doorway of the study. You wished to see me, sir? she asked courteously. Yes, Darcy replied. Please come in and... Close the door behind you. Miss Elizabeth Bennet cast an experienced glance out of the window and bent her head over the desk. The sun on the eastern horizon glowed through a haze of pinks and purples, which meant it was still very early. She knew from long experience that once she was awake, there was no point in staying in bed, and she owed her friend Charlotte Collins a letter. The Galloping Goose, Derbyshire, June 3rd, 1812. My dear Charlotte, I write to you from The Galloping Goose, which is, I hope you agree, an absurd name for an inn. I have observed geese flying and fluttering and even running, but certainly never galloping. It matters not. The feather beds are comfortable and the inn is not as noisy as many of the places in which we have stayed on our journey north. Oh, and the cook is marvellous. I am thankful we stayed here two nights, as it gave us the opportunity to walk to a nearby waterfall yesterday morning. It was quite magnificent, Charlotte, with the water falling into a deep basin and swirling ominously. Mrs. Hurst, who accompanied me and Charles on the walk to the falls, was in ecstasies over the wild flowers growing along the path. I confess to some surprise in Louisa. I found Charles's sisters proud and condescending at Netherfield last autumn, but now that Jane is married to Charles, Louisa has thawed toward both of us considerably. She also finds true joy in observing and sketching plant life, which gives us something to talk about during our times together. We will drive today to Pemberley, the magnificent estate of Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy himself. I can see to being most eager to meet the gentleman. Charles has said more than once that Mr. Darcy is the very best of friends, but then Charles, like Jane, looks for excellence in everyone. Lady Catherine de Bourgh also had nothing but good to say about her nephew, but I must confide that your husband's patroness and I do not agree about everything. Against these cries of praise are the words of Lieutenant George Wickham in Meryton. He claims that the Mr. Darcy is jealous, resentful, and proud, and that he cruelly refused to bestow a valuable living on Mr. Wickham, his own father's godson. I believe I can hear your very voice in my ears, my friend, and of course you are correct. I ought not to cast judgment until I meet the man, and I do promise you that I will be courteous and well-mannered during our time at Pemberley. At the very least, the grounds should be a joy to observe. I am glad to hear that the early peas grew well and that Mr. Collins continues to enjoy working in the garden. I did enjoy my time in Hunsford this spring very much, and often remember our pleasant hours of conversation together. I 
She broke off writing at a tap at her door and looked up in some surprise. The maid who brought her tea would not knock. Come in, she called, and a moment later the door swung open to reveal her beloved elder sister, Mrs. Jane Bingley. Jane, you are up early. I am, Lizzie, Jane agreed, her handsome face drawn with weariness. I woke up feeling quite ill and then could not get back to sleep. My poor Jane, Elizabeth said sympathetically. Would you care for some tea? I already had some, thank you, her sister responded, walking over to sink down on an overstuffed chair near the cold fireplace. I wished to ask you a favour, but I do beg of you to say no if you cannot bear it. Elizabeth lifted a dark eyebrow and smiled. I cannot imagine a request of yours that I would deny, my dear sister. You might deny this one, Jane returned with a comical twist of her lips. The Hurst's carriage has a broken linchpin, you know, and it has taken longer than expected to fix it. Two of the servants can wait here and ride with it to Pemberley tomorrow, while Charles and I, Caroline, the Hursts, and you take the servant's carriage to Pemberley along with our own. That sounds reasonable? Yes, it is, but the servant's carriage is not well sprung, and Mrs. Hurst suffers greatly from motion sickness, so she wondered if... If she could ride with you, and if I could ride with Caroline, Elizabeth finished. Precisely. Elizabeth considered for a few seconds, and then shook a reproving finger and responded dramatically. I will do it, of course, but you will owe me a great favour in return. If it really is too much, Jane began worriedly, only for Elizabeth to interrupt her by saying, I am teasing, my dear. I can manage a few hours of Caroline's company, I assure you. In fact, I dare say I will find our discussion most instructive. She knows all about the Darcys, of course. Jane cast her eyes heavenward and said, Yes, and is most eager to speak of her companionship with both Mr. and Miss Darcy. I do not know, Elizabeth. Perhaps you should sit with the Hursts, and Charles and I should journey with Caroline. Nonsense, Elizabeth replied briskly. It would not do for my beloved elder sister arriving at Pemberley wilting and nauseous. You are with child and ought not to be bumped around in a poorly sprung carriage. Thank you, Lizzie. I hope that Caroline will not be too exasperating. I do as well, Elizabeth returned with a smirk. Now, do go lie down again and try to get more sleep before we depart. Pemberley Please sit, Mrs. Ansley, Darcy suggested. His sister's companion, a pretty dark-haired woman of some five and thirty years, obediently walked over to a brown leather chair and sank into it, clasped her hands in her lap, and waited. Darcy made his way slowly to his desk and sat down behind it, deep in thought, and then said, You are aware that Mr. Bingley and his party will be arriving today? Yes, sir. I am concerned about Miss Darcy. Mr. Bingley is a kind gentleman, but his sisters, while eager to please, are overly talkative at times. Furthermore, Mr. Bingley's new wife and her sister are completely unknown quantities. I think that it would be unwise to bring Georgiana down to meet the party until I have the opportunity to meet and evaluate them. I agree, Mr. Darcy, Mrs. Ansley said composedly. Miss Darcy is currently working diligently on her new piece of music, and of course she is devoted to her activities outside. I believe she would not be pleased to meet the new guests today, as she is intent on mastering a particularly difficult passage. Darcy sighed. His sister did not especially like new people at the best of times, and now was not the best of times. If I may say, Mr. Darcy, Mrs. Ansley said hesitantly. Please do go on, Darcy invited. I believe Miss Darcy would do better if she met the newcomers one at a time, or in the case of the couples two at a time. I fear she would find an entire group to be overwhelming. That is a wise recommendation, Mrs. Ansley. I will consider how that can be arranged. Thank you. Chapter 2 On the Road to Pemberley I do beg of you not to concern yourself about your garments, Elizabeth, 
Miss Caroline Bingley said with false solicitude. Mr. Darcy will not think the worse of you for being simply attired, and it would be quite inappropriate given your station for you to wear the type of clothing which is common at Pemberley. Mr. and Miss Darcy, as close relations to an earl, wish for the distinction of rank to be preserved. Of course they do, Elizabeth returned, her eyes dancing. Miss Bingley was not a perceptive woman, but she was well enough acquainted with Elizabeth to know that her companion was amused. You find my words diverting? she demanded loftily. I do a little, Elizabeth answered. Pray forgive me, I'm not laughing at you, of course. It is merely that when I visited my friend Charlotte Collins in Kent a few months ago, her husband told me exactly the same thing before I had dinner with Lady Catherine de Bourgh, aunt to Mr. Darcy. The Darcys and de Bourghs are fortunate to have such loyal and faithful connections. I am most appreciative, Caroline. It would be quite dreadful if I put myself forward in an unbecoming way while staying at Pemberley. Caroline stared at her companion suspiciously, but Elizabeth merely peered back with limpid innocence, and Caroline was satisfied. I flatter myself that I am a close friend to the Darcys, the lady said complacently. Mr. Darcy is my brother's closest friend, and I am confident that Miss Darcy enjoys my companionship very much. She is a truly remarkable young lady. I've never met a girl so accomplished for her age. She is but sixteen, you know, and already plays the pianoforte far better than I do, and I know myself to be quite a master at the instrument. She sounds remarkable, Elizabeth replied, keeping her tone carefully neutral. She was quite certain she would dislike both Mr. and Miss Darcy profoundly. Mr. Darcy, of course, had deprived the charming Lieutenant George Wickham of a living intended for him, and Miss Darcy, according to the same Mr. Wickham, was excessively proud. Given their close familial relationship to the haughty Lady Catherine de Bourgh, it was no surprise that the Darcys were arrogant, though it was perhaps startling that Mr. Darcy was reputedly a close friend to Charles Bingley. At least Pemberley was reputed to be beautiful, and she would have Jane by her side throughout the entire visit. Sweet Jane, now Mrs. Bingley, could render any social occasion a pleasure. Elizabeth was also very fond of Charles, her new brother by marriage. She was not the sort of person to be easily intimidated, and in spite of Mr. and Miss Darcy's pride and Miss Bingley's sniping, she was certain she would have an agreeable time at Pemberley. Pemberley. Bingley, Darcy exclaimed as his friend stepped out of his carriage and onto the gravel drive in front of Pemberley. Darcy, his friend returned, reaching forward to shake his hand. It is so good to see you again. It has been entirely too long. I agree, Darcy replied, his soul lightening within him. It had been almost a year since he had enjoyed his friend's buoyant presence. It had been a difficult year, leaving him feeling emotionally dry and weary. Bingley had always been a good source of cheer, and Darcy had missed his friend more than he had realised. Darcy, I must introduce you to my bride, Bingley said, turning back toward the carriage. He held out his hand as a young woman, dressed in a dark blue gown, grasped his hand and stepped out beside him. Jane, my dear? Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, master of Pemberley and my good friend. Darcy, my wife, Mrs. Jane Bingley. Welcome, Mrs. Bingley, Darcy said, bowing as Jane curtsied. A moment later, Mr. and Mrs. Hurst emerged from the carriage, and in the midst of greetings and salutations, Darcy surreptitiously analysed the new Mrs. Bingley. His first thoughts were full of grim satisfaction. Mrs. Bingley was, as he expected, blonde and blue-eyed. She was also, he admitted to himself, remarkably handsome. Indeed, if she had come out in London society, she would have been one of the bells of the season. It was no surprise at all that the lady had captured Bingley's fickle heart, and, based on the proud expression on Bingley's face, the marriage was a satisfactory one. For now, at any rate... At least the new Mrs. Bingley was dressed with rather surprising restraint. Instead of wearing whites or yellows, which would show the dirt during the journey, she was wearing a patterned blue and green muslin gown. Her hat, too, was a simple straw hat, trimmed only with a blue ribbon. 
Mrs. Bingley looked far more sedate than he expected for a woman who had married for money. In the midst of his contemplation, another carriage had pulled up, and a feminine voice cried out, Mr. Darcy. Darcy slowly blew out a breath and turned to bow at Miss Caroline Bingley. The lady was, unlike her new sister, dressed in a light, diaphanous garment, and Darcy was startled to realise that the bodice was made out of silver muslin. It was a ridiculous gown to wear during travel, but it was also an expensive dress. Miss Bingley had always flaunted her wealth, especially when she knew that Darcy would be present. Miss Bingley, welcome to Pemberley, he said courteously, taking her hand and bowing over it. Thank you, Mr. Darcy, Caroline gushed. Oh, it has been far too long since we have seen one another. I do hope you and Miss Darcy are well. We are, Darcy said calmly, and was relieved when Bingley swam suddenly into view, his face wreathed with smiles, and said, Darcy, I must make you known to my new sister, Elizabeth, Mr. Darcy, our gracious host. Darcy, Miss Bennet, Jane's next younger sister. Again, Darcy found himself bowing across from an unknown lady, and again he found himself reluctantly impressed. The girl standing in front of him was very pretty, if perhaps not quite as handsome as her older sister, with dark chestnut curls peeking out from her straw bonnet. Like Mrs. Bingley, she was sensibly dressed in a tan dress with a green bodice. She wore a necklace with a simple cross around her neck, and her dark eyes glowed with vitality and intelligence. Miss Bennet, welcome to Pemberley, he said courteously. Thank you, sir. We are most grateful for your invitation, the lady responded, then turned toward the lake, which shimmered in front of the massive front façade of Pemberley. You have an incredible view here, Mr. Darcy. Derbyshire is wilder than my home county of Hertfordshire, and I find the hills and rocks and streams to be remarkable. Thank you, Miss Bennet, Darcy replied, thawing a little. The lady was unusual in complimenting the landscape instead of the house itself. Now, of course, the scenery is nothing compared to the mansion, Caroline Bingley simpered. Pemberley is awe-inspiring, and it is far greater than my brother's least mansion of Netherfield Park. As for Longbourn, well, it is no doubt a charming little house, but nothing compared to the edifice before us. Do you not agree, Miss Bennet? There was a poorly concealed, venomous note in Miss Bingley's voice, but Elizabeth Bennet merely smiled and said, Longbourn is much smaller, yes, but then my father's estate is far smaller than Pemberley. It seems reasonable that the size of the master's home ought to correlate with the size of the estate. That is true enough, Elizabeth, Mr. Bingley said, shooting an irritated look at his unmarried sister. But come, the sun is hot and Jane should get out from the rays. Jane Bingley blushed and said, Oh, I am well enough, I assure you. Bingley is correct, Darcy said courteously. Please, I beg you to come within. Mrs. Reynolds, our housekeeper, will show you to your rooms where you can refresh yourselves. Thank you, Mr. Darcy, Caroline exclaimed fulsomely. You are too kind. Twenty minutes later, Bingley, now dressed in buckskin breeches and an olive green coat, stepped into the study where Darcy was reading through a report on the wheat fields of Pemberley's home farm. Darcy set down the papers with a smile and said, do come in and have some brandy. Thank you, Bingley replied, wandering over to an open window which looked out over a large pond. Ah, that breeze is most refreshing. I am sincerely grateful for your invitation, Darcy. Jane is not entirely well, and the London air is not salubrious this time of year, nor is she comfortable in a moving carriage. I hope it is nothing serious. Well, no, Bingley said cautiously, and then grinned. I can trust you, I know. The truth is that we are quite certain Jane is with child. We have not told my sisters, but yes, it seems definite. Congratulations, Darcy returned, and he meant it. Like most gentlemen, Bingley was eager to sire an heir. More than that, though, his friend had always been excellent with children. Indeed, Bingley had met Georgiana when the girl was only ten years of age and had managed to befriend her, which was not an easy task. Darcy had even entertained the hope that one day Bingley and his sister would make a match of it, 
Bing Lee was one of the few men who would be consistently patient with his sister's more unusual character traits. It was not obvious that Georgiana would ever make a suitable wife to anyone, but Bing Lee had been Darcy's best hope, now lost. I declare I am the happiest man in all of England, Bing Lee said, breaking into Darcy's gloomy thoughts. I do pray that you find such a compatible wife, my friend. Life is unquestionably better with a loyal, faithful, and loving companion at your side. You are fortunate to have found such a lady, Darcy said, as he began pouring brandy into glasses. What can you tell me about your bride? I know you wrote me several times while you were in Hertfordshire in London, but I confess that your letters were... He trailed off, and Bingley laughed aloud. Difficult to read? I know that I am often illegible, and given my courtship and marriage to Jane, I was probably even more confusing than usual. I would be delighted to tell you about my wife and her family if it is not too boring. Not at all. Though I must ask, will Mrs. Bingley require your presence in the next hour? No. She urged me to come and spend an hour or two with you while she rests. Elizabeth will make certain that Jane is well cared for, and the two sisters are very close. That is good. Darcy replied, handing a glass to his friend and sitting down on a wingback chair near an open window. It is, Bingley said warmly, taking a sip of his own drink as he sank down into a chair near his friend. Well, anyone with eyes can see that my wife is incredibly handsome, but more than that, she's kind, gentle, loving, and godly. I've never met anyone with such a tender heart. She has won the loyalty of the servants, both at Netherfield Park and in our London house, through her good nature. Darcy was impressed. Many a woman won admiration from nobles and gentry because of her beauty, but a servant often saw a different side of her mistress. In truth, one of the reasons that Darcy disliked Caroline Bingley was that she was often rude to servants, indicating that her natural tendency was to be arrogant and disdainful toward others. When she dealt with her social betters, she managed to conceal such propensities, but Darcy was more interested in a woman's true character, as opposed to the facade she put on in elevated company. How many siblings does Mrs. Bingley have? he asked. She has four younger sisters, with Elizabeth being second to Jane. Her father is master of a small estate which borders Netherfield Park, called Longbourn. Regrettably, the estate will pass to a distant relation when Mr. Bennet dies, as the estate is entailed to the male line. That is most unfortunate, Darcy agreed with a frown. Do the daughters have reasonable dowries? Uh, no. Mrs. Bennet, whose father was a solicitor, brought £5,000 into the marriage, and it has become clear that Mr. Bennet has not set any substantial sum for his daughters. Darcy compressed his lips and said... They must have been very pleased at your marriage, then. Bingley's usually cheerful expression transformed into cold disapproval. They were pleased because they wished for their daughter to be happy, nothing more. I expect such remarks from Caroline, but not you, Darcy. My apologies, Darcy said hastily. Though there is no shame in a lady seeking a man of fortune, especially given the financial situation of Mrs. Bingley's family. But that is true enough, Bingley allowed, his expression relaxing. Though Caroline, and to some degree Louisa, drove me nearly mad with similar remarks when I was courting Jane. My younger sister kept whining that the Bennets were merely interested in my fortune and that my beloved would marry me for my money alone. Such absurdity. My dear bride is a most honourable woman, and she would not pretend an attachment which did not exist. Darcy blinked and took another gulp of brandy. On this occasion, he was inclined to agree with Miss Bingley's assessment of the situation, but it would be foolish to say so, and would only serve to offend his friend. For better or for worse, Bingley was married to the former Miss Jane Bennet of Longbourn, and nothing could be done about it now. Chapter 3 Thank you, Lizzie, Jane murmured, taking a sip of cold lemonade and then setting it on a wooden side table near the bed. Do not feel you must linger here. I expect that I will sleep for at least two hours. Elizabeth cast a longing glance toward the window, which was covered in nearly opaque shades, so that she could only see light dimly filtering through it. Are you quite certain? Of course I am. Indeed, I will find it difficult to sleep with you hovering over me. 
You should take a walk inside or outside the house, or perhaps prowl around in search of the library. Charles says it is most remarkable. Caroline Bingley said the very same, Elizabeth said with a roll of her eyes. So it must be true. Jane chuckled and lay back against her pillows. I do thank you for being civil to Caroline, even when it is difficult. I am afraid I am often satirical when we speak together, though I am not certain she understands that. I am certain she does not, Jane murmured, closing her eyes. You are being subtle, far more than father ever is, and she does not realise when you are poking fun at her. That is probably for the best, as I don't wish to be too unkind to her, Elizabeth responded as she leaned over to kiss her sister on the forehead. She stepped back and regarded Jane's face for a moment, then relaxed and turned to leave the room. Poor Jane had been feeling very sickly most mornings, and hours in carriages, even well-sprung ones, were hard on her. She was thankful they were at Pemberley, where Jane would no longer be jolted over good and bad roads. She stepped out of the bedroom and shut it behind her. Jane relaxed as the sound of her sister's footfalls faded. She groaned and curled up in a ball, attempting to find a comfortable position. She was overjoyed that she had already conceived a child with her beloved Charles, but she felt truly terrible much of the time, not just physically, but in her emotional state as well. She was used to being a calm, collected woman, but now she grew frustrated easily and often fought tears over foolish things. Elizabeth walked down the corridor a few yards and then entered her own room, which was adjacent to but not connected with Jane's bedchamber. That privilege was, of course, set aside for Charles Bingley. The guest quarters at Pemberley were as impressive as everything else, and thus Mr. and Mrs. Bingley were sharing a suite composed of two large bedchambers connected by a pleasant sitting room. Since Elizabeth knew that the Bingleys spent many nights together in the same bed, this was an ideal situation. For at least the hundredth time, Elizabeth thanked God for Jane's marriage. Her sister was a charming, sweet gentlewoman, but she was also inclined to look for the best in everyone. Elizabeth, with a far more pessimistic view of mankind, had worried that Jane, whose beauty was truly remarkable, would fall in love with and marry a man whose sole interest was in Jane's physical perfection. Instead, Charles Bingley had leased Netherfield Hall and fallen in love with Jane and she with him, and now they were happily married. Elizabeth was far less enamoured with her new sisters by marriage, though Louisa Hurst had proven a far more amiable companion these last months. Caroline, on the other hand, had tried her hardest to keep Charles from wedding the eldest Miss Bennet. Now that Jane was the new Mrs. Bingley, Miss Bingley retained a veneer of courtesy around Jane and her family of birth, but often made subtle comments about their lack of education, their lack of fortune, and their lack of connections. It said a great deal that even Jane, who desired to see good in everyone, no longer thought highly of her new unmarried sister. Elizabeth opened the door to her own chamber and sighed with pleasure as she entered the room, which was fitted up in greens and whites with a charming seascape dominating the wall surrounding the unlit fireplace. Elizabeth had never seen the ocean, but she hoped it was as marvellous as the painting depicted, with its white-capped aqua waves and tiny painted figures. The door opened behind her, and she turned as a young maid entered, her arms full of towels, and promptly squeaked in surprise. Oh, I apologise, Miss Bennet, I did not mean to intrude. Not at all, Elizabeth returned with a welcoming smile. In fact, I have a question for you. I would like to stretch my legs outside, but naturally I do not wish to interfere with the smooth operation of the estate. Is there a garden where I could walk, perhaps? Oh, yes, miss, the maid replied eagerly. If you will wait a few minutes while I finish my duties, I will guide you to the nearby door, which leads to the rose garden. It is lovely. It is just through that door, miss, the servant said, pointing at a wooden door at the end of the corridor. Thank you, Elizabeth said. She walked down the corridor, opened the door, which was decorated with carved rose blossoms, and stepped out onto a paved walkway. She found herself alone in a large sunken garden, which was located along the south side of the guest wing of Pemberley. She pulled in a deep 
breath of clean air and felt her body relax with pleasure. She had enjoyed the trip north with all its sights and sounds, but her current locale was both interesting and beautiful, and she looked forward to a time of relaxation. She began wandering along the paved path, which twisted and turned its way through a variety of rose beds, some filled with bushes, others with trellises, where roses had been trained to climb above her head. She had never seen such a profusion of rose blossoms, some red, some pink, some yellow, some white, some a mix of colours. The sizes varied as well, and the shapes and the combined scent of so many blossoms was a true delight. Her mother, who loved roses, would be cooing with wonder at the very sight of this garden. There were definitely advantages to being very wealthy. This little piece of heaven must require the services of numerous gardeners. After walking slowly for ten minutes, she crossed a small wooden bridge which was thrown across a tiny brook that wended its way from east to west in the garden. Elizabeth guessed that the water had been diverted from a large stream elsewhere. Pemberley seemed to be well watered, which was another point in its favour. It was perhaps not so surprising that Mr. Darcy was such a proud man. He was the extremely wealthy master of one of the largest, finest estates in all of Britain, Perhaps he had a right to be proud. She paused to sniff a large yellow rose on a trellis, whose head was bobbing happily in the slight breeze, just as a strange sound emanated from beyond the wooden lattice. She straightened, her brow wrinkled in confusion. It was something between a trill, a warble, a hoot, and a squawk. What man or woman or child or animal could make such a noise? She walked a few more feet and rounded the trellis, looking toward the source of the strange sound. A stone wall, at least ten feet high, loomed some distance away, a wall without a roof. It seemed that Pemberley, in addition to everything else, could boast of a walled garden. A paved path led from the rose garden across a patch of well-trimmed grass to a door in the wall. A moment later the same cry came again, obviously from within the walled area. Elizabeth started walking toward the door in a mixture of curiosity and concern. It seemed unlikely that a person could make such a noise, but suppose someone was injured within the walled plot. There were no servants in sight. Surely it would do no harm to take a quick peek within. Now that she was nearer the door, she could hear additional hoots and whistles. It seemed likely that there was an animal or animals within making the noise. But what animal? She reached out to the knob of the door, hesitated briefly, opened it, and stepped within. Is it not marvellous to be back at Pembley again? Caroline Bingley asked, staring out the window of her sister's sitting room. Yes, Louisa Hurst agreed from her seated position on a leather settee, her attention on her knitting. The air is fresh and fine after our weeks in London. I was quite pleased with our reception. I'm entirely certain that Mr. Darcy missed me. Louisa compressed her lips, but said nothing. She knew perfectly well that Mr. Darcy would never offer for her sister. Why should he? The money Caroline would bring into marriage meant nothing to a man who earned £10,000 a year in income. Darcy was nephew to an earl and a lady, and rumour had it that he was unofficially betrothed to his cousin Mr. Berg, heiress of the vast estate of Rosings in Kent. But Louisa also knew that her sister was wholly unwilling to admit that she was unsuitable for the role of mistress of Pemberley. Ever since Charles had brought Darcy to visit the Bingley's London home, Caroline had been enamoured of Darcy's good looks, wealth, and connections to high society. Until Darcy was actually married, Caroline would flirt and boast of her own accomplishments. It was embarrassing and annoying. Of course, Mr. Darcy may no longer be willing to marry me now that Charles has been foolish enough to wed Jane. Really, what was our brother thinking? Men cannot be trusted to look out for their own interests. If only Mr. Darcy had been able to join us at Netherfield last fall, he would have pointed out the Bennet's unsuitability, and Charles always listens to Mr. Darcy. Louisa frowned in irritation. Caroline had made similar statements at least 100 times since their brother's marriage to the former Miss Bennet. Jane is charming, kind, and gentleman's daughter, Louisa pointed out for at least the hundredth time. 
No doubt Charles could have won a better connected bride, but he and Jane seem very happy together. <laughs> Happiness. Caroline snorted inelegantly and began pacing up and down the blue and scarlet carpet. Happiness is for peasants. Our father did not struggle and strive and work so that his only son could be happy marrying a country girl with no dowry and poor connections, whose only asset is her considerable beauty. Louisa lifted her eyes from her knitting and glared at her sister. Jane is a pleasant, refined lady, and she and Charles are legally married. There is nothing to be done about it, Caroline. It would be best to accept the situation and turn your attention on to other matters. Caroline harumphed and sat down, and then admitted. You are correct, of course. Nothing can be done about Charles. However, I will not give up hopes for my own ambitions. If nothing else, Jane and Elizabeth will prove a good contrast to my own accomplishments. It is shocking how little they are able to do. Jane cannot draw or sing or play the pianoforte, and Elizabeth. Well, the people of Backwoods Meriton may think her an accomplished musician, but she plays and sings very poorly compared to us. Louisa was of the opinion that Elizabeth, while not an expert, had a charming voice and played with reasonable skill, but again, there was no point in defending her. She went back to her knitting with a sigh, letting a moment of silence pass before she spoke again. Perhaps you and I should practice a duet, she suggested, hoping to turn Caroline's thoughts in another direction. I'm certain the gentleman would enjoy such an indulgence in the near future. That is an excellent idea, Caroline responded, her face suddenly cheerful. I'm certain Mr. Darcy will be particularly impressed. Miss Darcy is, of course, a remarkable player at the pianoforte, but she sings not at all. She smiled to herself as she imagined this scene and said, no doubt Mr. Darcy will find the contrast between Elizabeth's passable attempts and my lovely voice to be compelling indeed. Mr. Darcy will offer for me by the time it is ready for us to depart, Louisa. I am certain of it. Chapter 4 Elizabeth pushed the door shut behind her and leaned up against the wood, overwhelmed with astonishment and wonder. She had expected the walled garden to be laid out with beds of flowers, perhaps with trees and fountains interspersed. Instead, the entire area, which appeared to be close to an acre in size, seemed more like a scene in an exotic painting. In the centre of the plot was a group of trees, each at least twenty feet high, under which numerous birds wandered to and fro all large, some with blue bellies and a cornucopia of green, yellow and blue iridescent feathers trailing behind them. Several of the winged creatures turned their heads towards her and began trilling and chirping, and the two birds closest to her retreated a few feet, obviously nervous about her presence. Who are you? a voice demanded sharply from her left. Startled, Elizabeth turned and observed a girl of some fifteen or sixteen summers standing near her. The young woman was dressed in a simple blue gown, which was rather too big for her, with an equally simple straw hat over her blonde locks, and she wore dirty half-boots on her large feet. "'I am a guest at Pemberley as of a few hours ago,' Elizabeth said coolly, arching one eyebrow in a challenging manner, she was not accustomed to peremptory challenges from the lower classes. Ah, uh, are you Miss Bennet or Mrs. Bingley? The girl asked, stepping closer, her blue eyes now focused on the cross pendant around Elizabeth's neck. I am Miss Bennet, Elizabeth answered in some confusion. It seemed unlikely that a servant girl who worked outside would know either her or her sister's name. Could this be an indigent cousin of the Darcy's or something of the sort? Do you like birds, Miss Bennet? The girl asked, gesturing toward the centre of the garden. Elizabeth turned back to viewing the strutting inhabitants of the garden and heaved a sigh of ecstasy. Birds hardly seemed the correct description for the wonderful creatures bobbing and trilling and murmuring within the stone walls of the garden. I am fond of doves and robins and rather afraid of roosters because one pecked me as a child, Elizabeth said. But I've never seen anything like this in all my life. Surely these are peacocks. The males are peacocks, the young woman said reprovingly. The females are known as pea hens, and their young are pea chicks. 
Altogether, they are known as peafowl. I suppose that makes sense, Elizabeth mused, her eyes focusing on a particularly handsome bird that was standing some yards away, its blue and green feathers rising high above its sleek, plump body. Without a doubt, this is astonishing. I've seen pictures of peacocks in books, but to see them in real life, they are more beautiful than I imagined. You truly like them? The girl asked in a suspicious voice, causing Elizabeth to turn and regard her with surprise. I do, she said. Truly, I cannot imagine anyone who would not like them. They are absolutely beautiful. My Aunt Catherine does not, the maiden responded with a scowl. She says that they are noisy and useless, and that it is idiotic of me to spend so much time tending to my peafowl when I ought to be learning to speak French and design tables. I have no interest in other languages, and we have plenty of tables at Pemberley, but that does not seem to matter to my aunt. Elizabeth's heart beat faster at these words, and she asked, Your aunt? Could you be referring to Lady Catherine de Bourgh? Yes, the girl said, frowning even more hideously. Do you know her? I do not know her well, of course, but I met her when I was visiting a friend in Kent a few months ago. But if Lady Catherine is your aunt, you must be Miss Georgiana Darcy? This provoked a look of surprise, and the girl said, Yes, I am Miss Darcy. Elizabeth took a startled step backwards and said hastily, I must apologise for this intrusion. I regret that... Oh, this is terribly awkward. Why? Miss Darcy asked, now looking perturbed. I ought not to have come here without your permission, or Mr. Darcy's, and we have not been properly introduced by your brother. I find formal introductions most tedious, Miss Darcy stated, turning her face to peer at her birds. Furthermore, you have my permission to observe the peafowl so long as I am here with you. Some of them are timid and others are aggressive, and it would not be safe for you or the birds to be here without my oversight. Would you like to visit the peafowl again? Very much, Elizabeth said warmly. They are astonishing, Miss Darcy. How many peafowl live here? Georgiana Darcy grasped a gold chain around her neck and pulled it out from behind the bodice of her dress, revealing a delicate watch. I must return to the house in five minutes to change before my lesson with my music master, she announced, ignoring Elizabeth's query. I will be here at noon tomorrow if you wish to join me. You can ask questions then. Thank you, Miss Darcy. Elizabeth said, her brow crinkling at the girl's abrupt manner. Perhaps I will see you in a few hours at dinner. Georgiana Darcy shook her head and declared, I will probably have a headache. Elizabeth blinked. I am sorry, I hope you feel better soon. No, Georgiana explained, her gaze drifting down toward the hem of Elizabeth's dress. I will not have a real headache. I do not like long dinners with people I do not know, and I am not fond of Miss Bingley. My brother says it is not polite to say that I do not like to be in the company of strangers and Miss Bingley, and that instead I should say that I have a headache. Elizabeth found herself smiling. Your brother is correct that it would be discourteous to be so blunt, but I will admit that I find Miss Bingley rather difficult at times as well. She's proud and conceited and she flatters me, Georgiana said simply. I must go, and you were not allowed to be in here without me. Oh, I am sorry. Elizabeth said, opening the door and passing through. Georgiana followed her, and, to Elizabeth's surprise, produced a key from her pocket, which she used to lock the door. Well, I hope to see you tomorrow at noon, Elizabeth said. That will be nice, Georgiana said, and hurried away.